man had need. My gracious alive, you can hardly get churches these days to agree to help people who are members of their own church. Mm -hmm. Most of us to help people who are out there in the community who mm -hmm. have need. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, if you and I were to tithe the way we're supposed to tithe and give the way we ought to give, and particularly if we would give sacrificially like the Holy Spirit of God speaks to our hearts sometimes about giving sacrificially, there would never be a lack of funds in order to help someone who has a genuine mm -hmm. need. Now, I'm not talking about people who want something. I'm not for the great giveaway program. I've been voting against that every four years ever since I've been, you know, able to vote. I've been voting against that. I'm not for the great giveaway program. But as far as the church is concerned, when there are people with genuine need, if the church does not have compassion, I just believe that that grieves the Holy Spirit and God's not going to bless the church that sustains the church. Right, right. Amen. Oh. Oh, yeah. I've heard three or four, but that's not quite enough. <laughs> When you look at our church budget, you see what we spend on ourselves and then what we spend on others. That's a great, that's a great distance between those two. And we need to be a sacrificing membership, willing to even part with things that we think we need. That's what a sac sacrificial gift is, by the way, you understand. Whenever you have something and you think that you really need it for yourself, but you're willing to give it over in order that someone else might have their genuine needs met rather than you, you know, hoarding it to yourself. That sacrificial gift, and uh, that's what kind of givers they were. They were a regenerate membership. They were a baptized membership. I believe they were a revived membership, to be honest with you. They were a studious membership. They were a praying membership. They were a sacrificing membership. And they were a united membership. Now, I know I've already mentioned this throughout the week, but anything that's worth saving one time is worth repeating. Say amen. amen. If it's worth saving one time, it's worth repeating again. The Bible says that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And I'm telling you, a church tonight, this is my word, a church divided against itself cannot stand. I remember Judy Hill used to tell this story, a true story, something that happened to him on a revival trail, and he's been in it for a long time, and he's got a lot of stories. Dr. Judy Hill said he went to this church for revival, when he got there, the pastor cornered it just as soon as he got there, and he said, I don't know what kind of revival we're going to have this week. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, this past Wednesday night, we had one of those business meetings. Anybody know what he means by that? He said, we had one of those business meetings. He said, well, tell me what happened. He said, we've got two brothers in our church. They are flesh and blood brothers, and they are spiritual brothers. Both of them. They've been in odds for 25 years. Whatever one's for, the other one is against he said, Wednesday night, brother number one, who always sits on this side, stood up and said, I make a motion, so and so and so and so. And his brother on the other side of the congregation stood up and said, I second that motion. And when he said, I second that motion, everybody's jaw dropped in the congregation. They hadn't agreed on anything in years and everybody was just stupefied. They could not believe what had just happened. And as soon as brother number two sat down, Brother number one stood back up and said, I withdraw my motion. <laughs> now folks, we're going to have to work together a little better than that. We expect God to send the Bible and God will be blessed and God will be pleased. Yeah. We talked the other night about being in one accord and being on the same page and having a singleness of heart, a singleness of purpose in a church. That's the kind of church that, 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 that this is. It is a, uni a united membership. Look at what it says in verse 46. And they continually daily, there it is, with, with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat, eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart. They were one in spirit. They were in one accord. I know everybody's waiting for me to tell that old joke. They, you know, they all got in one accord. That, that's that. I won't tell that joke. Y'all tell it to each other when you leave tonight. So <laughs> that warm slam out. I won't tell it tonight. They were in one accord. That's when God can bless the church. That's when God will really use the church. When that lost community out there cannot look on the inside and see deacons that are fighting one uh, against the other. Uh, uh, seeing, you know, staff members that are at odds with one another. Uh, well, I've, I've seen some of the the most disgusting things you can imagine, traveling around in revival, trying to go and have a revival in church where the pastor and the minister of you are mad with one another. And it's visible in the service that they're at odds with one another. I'm telling you, God is not going to bless that kind of meeting. He's not going to bless that kind of church. 
Whenever we are unified, when we are loving one another, whenever we have singleness of mind, singleness of purpose, we know who we are, we know what God has called us to do. Whenever we all gather around at the foot of the cross and say the cross is what it's all about, oh, God yeah. will begin to use us at that point. But I'm telling you, as long as we're pulling against one another and everybody's trying to get their way and finagling around in business meetings and all the rest, and, you know, having one of those outstanding committee meetings. You know, outstanding in the yard before you come in for the business call. Right. You know what I'm talking about? One of those outstanding committee meetings and thrashing things out and working things out and, and, and I'll do this if you do this and all the rest. And that spirit of compromise the will of God has hardly ever done. I, I wouldn't trust that in the public that I can see it. They were a united membership. By this shall all men know thee, my disciples, if you have love one to another. The Bible says you can't even worship God if you've got all your heart against your brother. You, they pass that plate around and you're dropping your money in, but you know good and well you have all in your heart. You have something against your brother. That brother's even in the room. And you have something in your heart against him. He has something in his heart against you. And you think God's going to receive your worship. You think, you know, that you're going to be pleasing in the sight of God as you open yourself up to him. He's waiting for you to do one thing. He's waiting for you to get, your, get yourself right with your brother or your sister. I've had that to happen in some revival meetings when I was preaching and doing the invitation. People would get up and go to someone else. I remember one time in particular it happened. I was a part of a meeting. I was not preaching. They were having a conference on prayer down in the Columbus Association. A dear friend of mine, uh, Rick Astle, had invited our state prayer uh, team to come and to lead one of those renewal things among the pastors. There they were, they were in the associational office. My Lord, of all places for God to move by the power of His Spirit in the associational office. And here are all these preachers. There were two lines of tables, one down this row over here, one row of tables over on this side, and preachers sitting on both sides of the table on both sides of the room. And they were up on this end, they had the screen up there, and they were going through the scriptures and talking about confessing sin and being thorough in confessing sin and repenting and getting right with your brother. And I'm telling you right in the middle of that, one of those pastors got up from this side and walked all the way around behind them and came around. I thought, what in the world? Uh, the rest of them the other way. What are he's going? You know, he walked all the way around just like this and came to this side and knelt down by another pastor and asked him to forgive him. He said, I have been belittling you in the community and I've had ill feelings in my heart against you. And they were renewed and restored. Now you talk about a revival breaking out. I mean, and, and God is still working on, on the after effects of that. that. That association has a revival emphasis every single year. A revival as a whole association. They call a preacher in and have a revival for the whole association. And God has done mighty things. And that really was the beginning. That was the catalyst of it all. You want to see God move in revival power? Then you find someone that you know you've got all your heart against them. You have something against them. They have something against you. And you get with your brother your sister and you make things right. Jesus said once you've done that, then you can come back and you can offer your offering. And I'll readily receive of what you are offering unto me. But until then, it's just a formal, empty way of trying to worship the Lord. They were a united membership. And they were a worshiping membership. In verse number 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. I believe, you know, whenever we get to heaven, the Baptists have to learn anything. It'll be how to praise the Lord. There are a lot of other denominations that I don't agree with, but when it comes to praising the Lord, I'll tell you one thing, they've got us beat hands down. Somebody asked me one time if I thought that the Pentecostals were going to make it to heaven. I said, if they don't run right by it. Because they're pretty excited and proud about their buddy. I mean, they, they will. They'll shout, they'll raise their hands, they'll get up and run and all the rest. And I know I'm not, you know, just saying that that's tonight what we ought to do, but we are pretty inhibited in our worship. Let's go ahead and shake our head like this, like a, like a bottle-headed dog, you know. I'm not, because we are pretty inhibited in our worship, you know. And why is it? You say, well, that's just the way I am, Brother Lord. Really? I saw you at the football game. Don't tell me that's the way you are. <laughs> you go out to the football game, it never has ceased to amaze me how people will go out in a cold, rainy night, sit on a hard bench with no back, 
They'll eat a hot dog that's cold, drink a cold drink that's hot, pay five dollars to get in, straight to the top of their lungs and have the best time. Get up the next morning talking about what a great time they had at the football game. But you let them come to the church and they'll sit down at the night on the lawn. Uh, talk about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and that, the fact that He's coming again one of these days. We're going to heaven. We're going to do the Lord throughout all eternity. They'll sit down like this. Now. Bless me, brother. Bless me if you can. Bless me if you can. <laughs> We're going to have to learn how to worship the Lord one of these days. You know, Pastor Phil, they said, I'm not going to be the preaching going on right there. There's going to be a lot of singing going on. A lot of praise and a lot of worship. We're going to gather together all those angels, you know. They're already about the throne. That's what the Bible says. They're serving about the throne. They're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I'm just telling you, one of these days, we're going to join in. We're going to sing a song the angels cannot sing. Angels never have been lost. They don't know what it means to be saved. How much more are you and I going to sing and praise the Lord, those of us who have passed from death unto life? I've even been saved by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and we'll never run out of anything to praise Him for. I mean, just you, you think about it. He's the one who created it all. Let's, let's praise Him in creation. Let's praise Him for incarnation. Not only did He stay there, you know, in heaven, but He was willing to come down here where we are. Amen. He became incarnate. Praise Him for His sinless life. Amen. I mean, He faced every temptation that all, all of us have, tempted, have, have faced and never succumbed to that temptation. I mean, praise Him for the crucifixion. Amen. Amen. For the atonement. For the redemption. For the fact that we have been ransomed, we've been adopted to his family. How, how long, uh, you know, where do you think you're going to run out of something to praise him for? I don't think so. Praise him for salvation. Praise him for his resurrection. Praise him for going back to heaven. Praise him tonight, even, for his intercession. Because you can't talk to God unless you talk to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God to make intercession for you and for me. We'll have plenty to praise Him for. Don't you worry about that. We ought to get started down here. That's my Amen. point. They were a worshiping church. They praised God. They remembered who they were, and now they know who they are, and they didn't mind praising God for what He had done in their heart and in their life. They were a worshiping membership. And then, they were a final. Witnessing membership. A witnessing membership. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so I've heard that word, Royce. I, I know that's the Great Commission. We memorized that when I was in Bible school, when I was way back, six or seven years old. That's not the only time it's said. Mark said it this way in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. He said, Go and preach the gospel to every living creature. Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 48, that we are to talk, take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus said in John 20, 20, and 21, He said, As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. You want to know why you've been saved? So you'll feel good, you know, you know you're going to heaven. There's a little more to it than that, ladies right. and gentlemen. As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. God only had one son who made a missionary out of him. He left the throne and glory of heaven came down here on earth on a mission. God only had one son who made a missionary out of him. And Jesus said, as the Father hath sent me, so send I you. And if you're under this mistaken notion that, you know, witnessing and evangelizing is the job of the pastor, maybe a few of the deacons, and certainly the evangelist who comes into town, I'm telling you, every saved person has been given the Holy Spirit of God. Wow. And He will tell you everything you need to know to share with someone. Wow. After all, all you've got to do is tell people what Jesus has done for you. That's right. And if you can't think of anything, maybe you need to go back to square one. Wow. <laughs> and make sure that you're part of the regenerate membership. They were a witnessing membership. When you get through with chapter 2, then you go to chapter 3. And then you go to chapter 4. And then the Lord adds another thousand, and then another five thousand, and then the Lord multiplies. They don't even use addition anymore. They are multiplying. Do you realize, do you realize what the church would really look like if every single one of us became a fisher of men? Wow. Do you realize what the church could become if every one of us would 
I mean, on a regular basis, share what the Lord Jesus has done for us and tell the good news of the gospel. Do you understand what the church would look like? Well, I'll tell you, it would look exactly opposite of what it looked like tonight across America. Do you know why our churches are so dead and so dull and so drab and so lifeless? Let me tell you why. It's because we're not obeying the Word of God, particularly in this area of sharing our faith. Statistics came out not too long ago from uh, the Barna Group. Once again, that did the study. And the Barna Group did the study of all evangelical believers in the United States of America. Here's the bottom line. You're not going to believe it. That 97.4% of people who say that they're saved will never share their faith their entire Christian life. 97.4%. Go to any church of a hundred, you have two and a half people who are willing to tell people what Jesus did for them and give them the gospel message. Imagine, we live in a day where people say that they're saved, have passed from death unto life, and only 2.6% of professing evangelical believers are willing to tell anybody what God has done. Folks, 97.4% is a high percentage. And I hardly think that I could quote that tonight and then not fall right on somebody's head in this service. You said, Brother Royce, I, I try to witness with my life. I try to live the very best life that I can in front of other people and let them see a changed life in me. And, and I want you to know you're doing half of what you're supposed to do. You're on the way, but you're only doing half of what you're supposed to do. As a matter of fact, if you go ahead and you live that perfect life, that at least the upright life, a, a blameless life, I should say it that way, you'll never live a perfect life, but if you live a blameless life, if you live a life that's, a, that's high in the esteem of others in the community, and then you don't tell them that it's the Lord Jesus that made you that way, what you're doing is you're robbing God of His glory. Right. What you're saying is, I'm able to do this in and of myself. And listen, there's none that is righteous. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. Unless we tell people that it is Jesus that has changed our life, we're robbing God of His glory as though we are somebody, have made something of ourselves. We have a lot of folks who are members of our churches and live an upright life, but never have told anybody who changed their life. Wow. Well, they were a different kind of church, weren't they? It's the kind of church we're supposed to be. That's not something that, you know, happened 2,000 years ago, and then that's a stage in church history. That was the beginning of who we're supposed to be tonight. Wow. I'm going to ask that tonight that you bow your heads and you close your eyes and just, boy, I need a lot of hindrances to revive. We've talked about those things. I'm not enumerating.